Thank you. Can you hear me all right back there? OK. I want to start uh, with th thanking you for coming. I know it's a nice hot day in the middle of June in downtown Scottsdale, and I appreciate it. This talk today is some of the excerpts from the book, how we got the book written, and, and how we came about with the title. When I first started writing the book, and it was called The Nerve of It, How Sugar is Destroying Our Nerves, I still think that would have been a better title. But my editor at, at HarperCollins in New York said, no, it's too narrow. Sugar is the big problem. We got to go with Sugar Crush. And she's probably right. But um, I wanted to share that with you. So we have a huge problem with sugar in the United States. But now, not only in the United States, but it's a pandemic problem. About 350 million people in the world have diabetes, and another 350 million have prediabetes. And we'll talk about those differences during the talk. The specific number that I'd like you to see is the 65-year-old or older. 50% of the people over 65 either have diabetes or prediabetes. That's an alarming number. Uh, and that, that number, in my opinion, doesn't have to be. There's 30 million people uh, and 8 million undiagnosed. That number is probably higher today. Different ethnic classes have different rates of diabetes. And I'm going to be talking about the American Indian population because they're right here in Arizona. And they have the highest rate with a 50% amputation rate at age 40. So how did we get here? Most people flew, right? No. By, uh, we have diabetes because we love sugar. Christopher Columbus, in 1493, in his second voyage, brought sugar to the New World. That was really the main reason why he came here. Yes, he was looking for gold, but they knew in Europe that sugar was coming from somewhere. And that's really the answer to the question. On his second voyage, he came back with 17 ships and 1,000 men. Uh, the first expedition with three ships, I didn't know this when I was writing the book, only two ships returned. One sank. 21 men were left on an island. He came back the following year, and they were all dead. He didn't know what happened to them. Well, they were lonely, went across the other side of the island, found the native girls. The boys there didn't like it, and they killed them all. So this talk is about sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's how the country was started. And it went downhill from there. No. Uh, let me go back to that slide. So the next guy, Napoleon, he liked to fight, fight a lot of wars. And he liked to have good food. And he wanted a substitute for butter. So he had a, a prize for people, uh, his scientists, to make that. He ran uh, the w winner. His name was Minet, Miner, uh, uh, his first name was Hippolyte, which I find interesting because cellulite, Hippolyte. <laughs> he ran hydrogen through lard and changed the classic uh, cis form in chemistry. That means just a ragged molecule. He added carbons or added hydrogen to carbons and made it flat. And you know that as trans fatty acid. It's a poison. And it's used in a lot of our foods and still used under different names. Um, in the 1830s, uh, the Indian population in the United States was put on reservations. And we changed their diet. When we changed their diet, we changed their outcome of the disease. Next major event was Ansel Keys in the 1950s. He came out and was honored on, on Time magazine with his theory that fat was bad. Well, fat is good, but he said it was bad. All the pharmaceutical companies got on board. Cholesterol, cholesterol was vilified. And we have been on statin drugs and anti-cholesterol drugs for the last 50 years, 60, 70 years. That is the basis for the diabetes epidemic. It was based on, I'll, I'll be kind to him, it was based on uh, cherry picking the data. It was called the seven country study. 22 countries, however, are the ones that he studied. The other 15 was sugar. But he didn't tell us that. 
Next major event was 1971 with McGovern. And I like that name, McGovern. Remember when he ran for senator? Mick Govern. He wanted everybody to be the same. And he wanted everybody to eat wheat because he was from the Dakotas. He went to Congress. He said, I got a deal for you. We can't sell this stuff. How do we get rid of it? First thing he did was, let's have the taxpayer pay for it, and we'll call it Food for Peace. Second thing was food stamp program. And that is now up to about 50 million people. So we can credit him with that. And you all remember Atkins back in the 70s? And he came to a Senate hearing, and he said, I think this is all wrong. Fat is good, sugar is bad, carbohydrates are not good. They vilified him, they crucified him, and they brought a guy in from uh, Harvard, and he, um, he said, no, uh, Atkins is all wrong. He's doing it for the money. And that's how we got the food pyramid started. Now, of course, when Starnes got back to Harvard, he had a nice check waiting for him from Kraft Foods for $5 million for his laboratory. So there's a lot of political deceit and the construct the the political process lends itself to a lot of deception. 1975, high fr fructose corn syrup. And it doesn't matter which side of the aisle you're on. Uh, Nixon was worried about high sugar prices. He allowed the high fructose corn syrup to come into our diet because it was much cheaper and, and much more sweeter. And it, it comes in a liquid. You can put it every, in everything we have. And then the next one, uh, and there's more, but I'll stop right here on the history. Reagan allowed artificial sweeteners to get into our diet through the FDA. It didn't pass the first time. Donald Rumsfeld was the president of that company, G.D. Cyril, and then they reappointed a member. It went through, and now it's in lots of different foods. So it's a circle of deception. Controlled by Big Agra, Monsanto is probably the number one company in this process. And 70% of the, all the foods in the United States are manufactured by seven companies. Now, this is the new food pyramid. The food pyramid uh, was made into a plate, as if this was healthier. But this is the old shell game. If you look at the fruits, fruit is nothing but sugar. I know you're supposed to eat fruits and vegetables. But the fruit you, ate, you eat today is not the same fruit you ate 40 years ago. Those in the audience here remember when you had a grapefruit? Did you put sugar on it when you were a kid? Absolutely. Why? Because it was very, very tart. Today, all fruit is extremely sweet because it's been hybridized. It's been bred to be very, very sweet. That's why we like it. So when you see it on a food pyramid, you think you're eating healthy. This is the number one cause of diabetes and cancer in the United States. Vegetables, same issue. Potatoes and potato chips and potatoes and, uh, and French fries, that's a vegetable. That's sugar, corn, sugar, anything you like. I have a phrase I say, if it tastes good, don't eat it. <laughs> unless you read the label. And we'll show you how to do that. So even dairy, they'll fight again. Dairy in the United States um, is really sugar water. We took the fat out. Should have taken the, the sugar water out and kept the fat. But fat is expensive. And we were told not to eat it, remember? So who's making us eat this besides our federal government? Now, there's a little guy in your brain called the hippocampus. That's Latin for seahorse. And that's a little structure in your brain, which is the addiction center. It doesn't care if you have heroin, codeine, wheat, sugar. doesn't matter. You'll get addicted to whatever you're eating in abundance. And wheat, carbohydrates, these are all addicting processes. So the cycle of defeat. Get it? Defeat? Yeah? So the hippocampus, making you eat this stuff. You look at a glass of orange juice, and you say to yourself, yeah, I need vitamin C, which you do. But really, what you're drinking is sugar. So your hippocampus says, yeah, go ahead and drink that stuff, because I love that. So the hippocampus knows the food pyramid. The old one on the bottom. Here's an interesting fact. Six to 11 helpings of carbohydrates are on the bottom of this pyramid. 
they want you to eat five meals a day because everybody need, knows that you should eat five meals a day. Well, if you're selling food, you should eat five meals a day. They would have more if they could. So that's about two helpings of carbohydrates at every meal. If you do that, I guarantee you, we can get you up to 350 pounds. But it's a lot of work. Because your brain, although it operates on glucose, doesn't necessarily have to get it from eating glucose. There's a concept called gluconeogenesis, which you manufacture your enough energy needs from fat. That's a hard one to, uh, to comprehend because you were taught absolutely the opposite. High fructose corn syrup, sugar, doesn't matter, fructose, sucrose, wheat, anything will, that will produce an insulin response will make you fat. Fat cannot make you fat. Fat makes you skinny because you have to have insulin to put the pounds on. So insulin levels in your body are the key to health. So all sugars, all carbohydrates, anything that tastes good breaks down to monosaccharide, which is glucose. Now, the reason I wanted to call this book the nerve of it, part of it was because the nerve of them to teach us for 50 years fat was uh, bad and the substitute sugar was good, in my mind, is fraud. Uh, and it's exactly the opposite. This morning I was looking at the television and a Cheerios ad came on. Heart healthy. Cheerios is nothing but sugar. Sugar causes heart attacks, not fat. And to advertise that is a, I don't know where the FTC is in this, but two-thirds of the patients that are admitted to this hospital right here have high levels of sugar. That's what my patients tell me. I said, or I ask them, so when did you have that heart attack and when did you get diabetes? Well, when I was in the hospital, when I came out, I got diabetes in the hospital. No, it was discovered in the hospital because that's what caused your heart attack. 50% of people in this hospital and all hospitals in the United States do have high levels of cholesterol when they have their MI, myocardial infarction. You know what the other half have? Low cholesterol. It has nothing to do with heart disease. Nothing. It's sugar. Two-thirds of the patients admitted have high sugar. So, my book and thesis is that sugar causes, through the biochemistry, these biochemical pathways, which we'll touch on. And this is what, this is what makes the book somewhat difficult. Nitric oxide pathway, the advanced glycosylated end products, and the polyol pathway. And, and we'll, we'll talk about that in the answer in the question and answer series, but we'll kind of touch lightly on it as we go through. But when those chemicals get around and in nerves, they cause compression, squeezing of the nerve, cutting off the blood supply until the nerve doesn't function. And in the foot, that's what happens. I think everybody on the left had feet like that, or most people, and 100,000 people go on to have amputations in the United States. But millions of people have these ulcerations. And the answer is sugar. It's really that simple. So it's the diet. So I set out in 1981 on a quest at the request of uh, Dr. Luke Chu, who is a uh, medical doctor and a uh, PhD in pharmacology. He asked me in 1981 to go to Taipei, the capital of Taiwan, to look at their diabetes problem. <coughs> Spent three weeks there, lectured, went all over the island, and that building right there, uh, on the building right here, is their research tower. And first of all, I didn't see very many diabetics. 1981, they hardly had anybody. But the amazing part was, they never had anybody. So I said, let's look out the window, fast food restaurants. This was 1981. First fast food restaurant, 1979, two years they had an epidemic. That's amazing. But only the rich, because the rich are the only ones who could afford it. The poor people there couldn't. Now, they are rich, and they have a tremendous disease, disease problem. So at the end of my three weeks, they, they, they're big um, banquet people. They honor people, and they said, they have this huge banquet for me and 
generals and just about everybody came to the, this party. So they had these Indian, excuse me, Taiwanese Aborigines dance after the, uh, uh, the meal. And I said, wow, American Indians. Oh no, Taiwanese Aborigines. No, American Indians. Look at the beadwork, the knife, they had moccasins, their dancers were the same. Really exactly the same. They came from an island off the coast of Taiwan called Luan. So I came back to the US, and I don't know if some of you people may know this guy, Dan Naminga, has a huge mural at the uh, airport. He's a Hopi Indian artist. See the eyes on these people? He paints. Very oriental. Even he has a little bit of an oriental flair. I said, Dan, uh, I met your ancestors. Have you ever been there? No. How do you get the, the faces like that? I don't know. They just comes to me. I said, I'm telling you, that's where, they're, that's where they're from. That's where you're from. That's his cousin, Alan Hauser, who did the peace pipe at the UN. These are extremely talented people. They're on the third mesa. Uh, and they have, they have these amazing talents. So we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit later. So then I looked at the um, Pima Indian tribe. And this is, a, this is about the 1830s. They lived off the land. They looked just like the ones I saw in Taiwan. They ate a natural diet. They hunted, fished every day until we decided they needed to be on a reservation. Put them on a reservation. We gave them wheat, sugar, and lard. And now we have the biggest epidemic of obesity in a culture right next to Scottsdale in the world. 50% amputation rate. and at age, at age 40. So they're lean and mean on the natural environment, and they're overweight in an artificial environment. Believe me, it's sugar. So then I really got interested. I ran into a fellow by the name of Lee Dellen. He's a professor of neurosurgery and also a plastic surgeon from Johns Hopkins, arguably the world's brightest human being. Heard a lecture from him about 15 years ago. I was working at the Wound Care Center, and he said to us, oh, this is the ironic part. This is where I trained in Philadelphia at Pennsylvania Hospital. Not with Ben Franklin. He was a little bit before me. And that was the first hospital in the United States. There is the, and still there, and still looks like this. And he said, why do you cut nerves out in the foot? I said, well, that's what we were taught to do. Thomas Morton, Morton's neuromas, which is nerve problem in the foot. He practiced at the Pennsylvania Hospital. I didn't know that, but Dr. Dellen did. And when he said that to me, I thought, well, I need to, I need to start reading the papers, because I never read the original paper. But he did, because he really didn't know the anatomy of the lower extremity. And he mapped out a whole process of nerve compression in a diabetic population. In the 80s, he's a patient he was operating on that, you're familiar with carpal tunnel, the wrist, and the ulnar tunnel of the elbow. And the woman who was diabetic, and she said to Dr. Dellen, after he fixed the, her arm, why don't you fix my leg? And he said, well, that's not done. You know, that's diabetic neuropathy. This is carpal tunnel. Well, why would it be different? He said, well, I don't know. He did primates, uh, experiments. Uh, rats, very sophisticated experiments that we talk about in the book. And he came up with this uh, compression theory that was first talked about in 1973 by a fellow, two fellows by the name of Upton and McComas. And they said serial constraints along one nerve, and they were talking about the carpal tunnel, a little bit of pressure does not cause pain. A secondary pressure causes pain along the nerve in the neck or the wrist. But they noticed 16% of the patients had diabetes. And this is 1973 when no one had diabetes. So that's the basis for nerve compression. So the hard part, compression, how does it happen? Well, AGEs is really a process of what's called the Maillard reaction. And that's a cooking term. Thanksgiving, you, put, you baste a, chick or a turkey. It gets brown and crispy and tastes great. That's a collagen. That's what we call protein. When you mix protein with sugar, 
it contracts it, it makes it very stiff. Cataract is the Mallory reaction. Uh, wrinkles, nerves get crispy. You're slowly, slowly cooking yourself to death. This is a funny little sidebar to that. I said the Mallory reaction. I get a guy in the back, he says, Monsieur, this is not the Mallory reaction. I said, what is it? He says, it's a French word, it's the milieu reaction. I said, well, you know, I'm from Philly. He said, no, you, you must say milieu. So I said, did you see the Pink Panther? <laughs> yeah. Steve Martin, he came to America and he was trying to learn, learn the word hamburger. And he said, hamburger. I said, it's the Mallory reaction. So remember that it's cooking your nerves and making them very crispy. And when you cook them, you contract the tunnel that goes through. It doesn't matter what tunnel in the body. So we're talking about the carpal tunnel at the moment. Second reaction is sugar gets in the nerve. And when it gets in the nerve, that's a polyol pathway. And it causes the nerve to swell. So we have a compressing outer covering and a swelling nerve inside. To me, that's compression. And the third pathway is the nitric oxide pathway. And this is the one I work with John Cook at Stanford uh, working on my theory. And that blocks the blood supply to the nerve. So I went back to Dr. Um, um, Dellen about five years after I had done the cases. And by the way, I did the first case here at Scottsdale Healthcare. And it was a difficult case. The woman was, um, had a twin sister. She died from diabetes. I had this lady in the hospital every year, at least for 10 years. Little piece of toe here, and et cetera. She was in a wheelchair. She couldn't feel anything, couldn't walk. I said to her, I said, Janet, we have no other options. I said, well, let's do it. My first case, which probably was not my best. And we did the surgery. She did fine, but I didn't see her for about four months. She walks into the clinic, walks in, no wheelchair, no braces with a sling on her arm. And I thought, what? I don't, I don't get this picture. Oh, I was just here to say thank you. I was walking. My husband took me to Hawaii. I was climbing on the lava rocks. I fell and broke my arm. Thank you. Wow. So that gave me strength to, to look at all these different conditions. I went back to Dr. Dellen. I'm going to work with, I, I found Dr. Cook at Stanford. I think there is a third pathway. There is, and there's chemistry behind it. And that was 10 years ago. Then I went back to Dr. Dell and I said, if, if this is true, carpal tunnel and the ulnar tunnel are a nerve compression, and you have proved that the lower extremity of all the nerves in the leg, in the common perineal nerve, and all these different nerves are correctable, then why is this not a more global thought process. So the lower extremity, we, we do a fasciotomy. In other words, we open up the tunnel at the knee, on top of the foot, and in the arch, which is the tarsal tunnel. So I was working with Cook, and he had written a paper in 2004. And I, it's amazing. I text him about my theory, and he called me on the phone the same day. I mean, he's a full professor at Stanford. I don't know if you know Gerald Raven and the words metabolic syndrome, but these are the fellows that coined that word. And um, Shumway, who is a famous cardiovascular surgeon, they're all in that center and building. So he thought I was correct. He said, come up there. We did a lot of experiments. His marker is called asymmetric dimethyl arginine. You don't really need to get too much in that, but sugar causes this to be a problem in your body. So we looked at uh, metabolic syndrome. Are people who have neuromas in their foot, nerve problems, do they have diabetes or metabolic syndrome? Yes, about 42%. That's a big number. So is diabetes caused by sugar? Absolutely. Does compression cause nerves to swell? Absolutely. And does sugar cause the tunnel to contract? So if you're in a tight spot and the tunnel's getting tighter, and then this is using a, a diagram of a car or a truck, it's going to get stuck 
and it's not going to work. So we have all the biochemistry to, to figure all this stuff out. So then I went back to Dr. Dellen again. He said, oh, what is it this time? I said, well, I think that all the nerves in the body, if they have the same biochemistry, and the anatomy is the same, then why wouldn't every disease that has a, what we call neurodegenerative disease, wouldn't they all be the same? You can't have biochemistry just affecting the wrist and not the neck. That would be illogical. So, isn't it reasonable to think that all of the modern chronic neurodegenerative diseases are part of this process? And my answer is yes. Now, I have not proved any of this, but we'll go through it and you see if this makes logical sense. And this is really what the book's about. That's why I want to call it the nerve of it, but it's sugar crush. So, if we looked at all the tunnels in the body and we did you had pain, numbness, burning, paresthesis, muscle weakness, loss of function. That's pretty much the same for any nerve compression, whether it's the hand, the foot, your back, your shoulder. Even diseases like ALS, MS, I contend ALS is really part of this, and autism. And you're going to say, oh, that couldn't possibly be. But it is. So the signs, when you tap on a nerve, it creates a tingling sensation. And we can prove that clinically. Or a provocative sign, it hurts. Nerves don't hurt if you press on them, only if they're inflamed. We have the laboratory testing to make that diagnosis, nerve conduction, the gold standard. Decreased amplitude and increased latency, which means the lights are going out. The electricity is fading. So the end organ, doesn't matter if it's your eye, your toe, or your ear. It's the same process. But what I'm saying is not accepted, actually never been thought about. So those, those biochemical pathways are all the same for all nerves. So genetics, yes, for sure. But there's really a term called epigenetics. Let's look at the Indian population. In a natural diet, they do not have diabetes. Everybody carries a gene for something. But they, it's like two experiments. Here's, a, here's the same people, no sugar, no diabetes. Same people, all sugar, all diabetic. I mean, it's a pretty simple equation. So they have the same genes. So, it's the environment you're subjected to. So there's a lot of different causes and variables from fatty acids and omega-3 fatty acids, all that sort of thing. But sugar is really the common denominator. The fibro-osseous tunnels in medicine is what we call these tunnels. They're all the same throughout the body. Because an artery, nerve, and vein go through those tunnels. Biochemistry is the same. And the pathology is the same. What's different, however, is the end organ receptor. Now, in the eye, in the retina, and you see changes. And th those receptors, rods and cones, are not seeing the light. So just think of this for a minute. The optic nerve that's behind your eyes, if I squeeze that optic nerve, do you think you would see better or worse? Well, medicine doesn't subscribe to that. They do lasers and medicine in the end organ receptor. And I think it's the wrong approach. Now, I'm a podiatrist. So if you came in and you had an ulcer in your foot, most people, probably 99% of the people, would look at that ulcer as they look at the eye and do something local to the foot. I don't. And Delan, I call them Delanites because we drank the Kool-Aid to believe this. But I've done well over 2,000 cases with this surgery. We haven't had any amputation. The Indian population is 50%. They scrape the pus off the ulcer. I go behind the eye, behind the leg, and do a decompression. Feeling comes back, turns electricity back on. So you can have all kinds of different receptors. In the foot, is a mechanical receptor. Run your hand over the chair that you're sitting in, and then the metal part. 
Without looking, do you feel a difference? I said to a lady in our clinic when we were doing nerve conduction tests, I said to her, how do you know that? And she said, because. <laughs> well, the reason is because, look at your finger. See those little ridges? If you looked at it microscopically, there's a little nerve under each one of those on, this, on the receptors right here. And as that gets depressed, you can feel pressure. So you know the difference between rough, smooth, cold, hot, all that sort of thing. These little fingerprints were not placed here by the FBI. They were placed here so you could feel. I thought it was the FBI when I first started. No. So they're called mechanical receptors. Or the sense of smell. They're chemoreceptors. So a chemoreceptor is taking chemicals out of the air so you can, you can smell it. What's the first symptom in Alzheimer's? Loss of smell. Not memory. Because you can't remember that you forgot how to smell. So you keep putting more cologne, perfume, hot sauce, because you're losing that sense of taste and smell. So then, I mean, there's a person who walks into a room and they say, oh my god, who has all that perfume on? That's the person who's going to have Alzheimer's. Because they can't smell. They don't know it, though. It's the cranial nerve number one, the olfactory nerve. That goes through a very small aperture in the skull. Sugar swells the nerve. The aperture doesn't get bigger. It cuts off the blood supply. The end organ doesn't work. So demyelination is a process, not a disease. But in, like in MS, they call, oh, you have a demyelinating disease. You're losing the covering on your nerve. It's autoimmune, whatever that means. It's not. It's a compression neuropathy. So if we looked at all these nerves, and I have, uh, there, see all the, the end organs? So it doesn't really matter what those end organs are. These are all different nerves doing some particular function. Uh, let's take the seventh cranial nerve in the face, Bell's palsy. Everybody heard of that? So that nerve innervates a muscle in your face. If that muscle is not working because the nerve is swollen, then you drool. Pretty simple. Bell's palsy, and named by a doctor in the 1800s. He didn't know this stuff, so he got his name on it. And we're still treating the same way. So it doesn't really matter which nerve. We call them different things. Trigeminal neuralgia, tic delaru. In my opinion, it's sugar, because the nerve is swollen and compressed. So let's take a look at autism, the most controversial thing in the book. So when I was doing the research for the book, I came upon autism. Believe me, they didn't want me really to put this in here. But I said, well, you've got to put it in there because it's what I believe. I'm reading an article in the year 2000 and in Scientific America, written by an embryologist. And just to make this story more concise, between where the hypoglossal nerve nucleus is forming there's a difference of 1.1 millimeter in autistic kids. I thought that interesting. Now, they were embryologists. This is the year 2000. This is before I came to this conclusion. The hypoglossal nerve, it runs to the tongue. It's involved in speech. What's the first symptom in autistic spectrum disorder? Delayed speech. So I read on. On day 22 to day 24, after conception, the hypoglossal nerve nucleus forms. And there's two proteins that are put down right in that area, one of which doesn't form. To me, if you take a space with the nerve in between and you make the space smaller, what would you call it? I call it compression. But why? There's a fertility doctor in town who is studying this biochemistry and did a paper on this years ago. And we had a discussion the other day. In his laboratory, artificial insemination, his patients, doing exactly what I'm talking about, 
How many kids does he have from his inseminations under a controlled environment of perfect but diet? How many autistic kids does he have? And the answer is zero. I think that's profound because in the year 2000, it was 16 per 10,000 when that article was written. And today is one birth with autistic spectrum disorder in 50. That's a huge number. Answer I get back, well, we have better diagnosis. So you're telling me doctors 15 years ago were that stupid. No, it's the diet. High fructose corn syrup, in my opinion, is causing this genetic change, causing this biochemical change, and then a mechanical change. Can I prove it? No, but zero in a controlled environment? When most conceptions in the United States probably occur with a six pack of beer and a pizza. <laughs> so, it's the diet. MS, same disease, same process, different nerve. And this is the vagus nerve. Vagus nerve is the nerve in your neck. Gets compressed, long story, but it is a compression neuropathy. Terry Wall, physician in Iowa, breathing through a straw in a wheelchair, changed her diet, get out of the wheelchair. When doctors get the disease, they pay attention. A neurologist in San Diego, his son got MS. He was an investigative neurologist, so then he started looking at MS. Didn't make sense. What's autoimmune disease? He went up to Stanford, they did the Zamboni procedure, which is uh, from out of Italy, put a stent in your jugular vein, dilate it, he got out of the wheelchair. So it's a compression neuropathy. I theorized that the jugular vein, the 10th nerve, is sitting on the outside, and when he did that, he pushed the nerve off and loosened it up and had better conduction. So that process, Zamboni, that was 2007. FDA stepped in, you haven't done the proper studies. You're not allowed to do that. Wonder who pushed on that. Could it be drug company? No. So they have to do $300 million study. You can't do that on a surgical patient. But you can do it in medicine because you, you can charge a lot of money. So Sabre is $100,000 a year. So I believe all these diseases are the same. We have this um, phasing of the disease. That's why they're called remitting. You get these little zingers in your feet. Uh, it comes and goes, and then you get up to what we call a sensory problem. It's painful. And then, later on in the disease, phase four, patients say to me, Doctor, you know that Lyrica is really working. I don't have any pain anymore. They're completely numb. They get to phase five. I'm totally cured, but what's that hole in the bottom of my foot? And why does it smell so bad? And they get an amputation. They're not cured. They just don't feel it. So. It's metabolic syndrome is just that cascade of symptoms leading up to this final event. So let's talk about truffles. Truffles is my wife's ex-miniature pig. <laughs> truffles uh, was fed the normal diet, a normal diet of what the vet said to eat, and that was grain. He would run out, eat, and run back and drink water, and did it rather quickly. He was dead six months or six weeks later. He had diabetes. Pigs don't eat grain. Humans don't eat grain. We feed them grain to make them fat, whether it's a pig or a human. Feed them grain, bread, pasta, crackers, everything we like, and you will make them fat and eventually kill them. With pigs, they don't usually live that long because we butcher them. Humans, we like to live longer because we need to feed them a lot of medicine over that time. <laughs> Daisy the chicken. These are my three dogs here. They're carnivores. The chicken is the same process. Chickens are from the vulture family. They don't eat grain, but that's what we feed them. We had the bird flu epidemic because we put them in pens. We force feed them. Now 10% of the chicken fl flock has been ruined because they have autoimmune issues. They can't defend themselves. They have tons of different antibiotics, growth hormones, but the most amazing thing I found writing the book, which is not in the book, a chicken goes from an egg to full grown and slaughter in 30 days, which is amazing. 
and they feed them arsenic. So your chickens you're eating from a, from a what's called CAFOs, where they're crowded in there, are eating chicken. And, and arsenic is, I mean, arsenic is in the chickens. So they stay awake 24-7. So if you can't sleep at night, I'd check your arsenic levels. No, I'm only kidding. So high fructose corn syrup, and I'll go through these so quickly so we can get some answers, a question and answers. High fructose corn syrup, 80% of the food in the United States has high fructose corn syrup. A third of that has mercury. That's how it's made, with, with sodium hydroxide. You separate the kernel from the, from the starch. Sodium hydroxide uses mercury for a catalyst. A third of the 80%. Didn't know that. Well, I don't think anybody does. So how do you read labels? No one knows how to read labels. Dr. Dellen texts me five times on this one. That, what did you say? Well, here's the easiest way to do it. Look for the total carbs and divide by four, and that's how many teaspoons you would have. So what do you think has more? Yogurt or Reese's peanut butter cup? Yeah. Well, I happen to like Reese's peanut butter cups. They were tough to give up. But it has less sugar than the yogurt. So if you want sugar, why wouldn't you eat the chocolate? Don't torture yourself with yogurt you don't like, right? <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it's crazy. I mean, we're all going to eat some sugar, but enjoy yourself. Glyphosate, I'll end with these thoughts. Glyphosate is the active ingredient in Monsanto's Roundup that causes the genetically modified foods to be toxic. Only in the United States do we use them. Europe refuses to use them because they're toxic. They will kill you. But that's what we eat. So if you're eating corn that's produced with glyphosate, processed with mercury, made into high fructose corn syrup, put in everything, do you think America is skinny and healthy or fat and sick? So in closing, it's our soil where it really begins. Around volcanoes, we have rich soil. Our breadbasket in the United States has been depleted of all these things. We're artificially making our food, and it's no wonder we're all sick. On Sing How many people know where Singh's farm is? Great place. I find this interesting because he's from India, Singh, on the Indian reservation. So I always tell him that should be a, his symbol should be dot on arrow farm. Let you think of that. It's the soil. He's a soil biologist. If the soil's good, the food is good. Yet, we have 50% of the people losing their legs on that reservation. They can grow their own food, but they don't. They go to the Circle K, six pack, corn tortillas, go to the Indian hospital, get their legs cut off. You pay for it through your tax dollars. It's a solvable problem. Thank you.